This week as I was mentoring a second grade boy at Brandywine Elementary School, we read a book about a group of young cats putting on a play at their school called The First Thanksgiving. In that book it mentioned a Native American named Squanto as being instrumental in helping the pilgrims avoid starvation during their second winter in Plymouth Colony. I know that the early history of the pilgrims in America and other European settlers was much more complicated than the simple story illustrated in a basic reader book about the first American Thanksgiving, so I did a little more digging about Squanto at History.com. Squanto's real name was Tisquantum, but for simplicity's sake, I'll continue to refer to him by his later anglicized name. Squanto was a member of the Patuxet Wampanoag Nation. The Wampanoag had lived in Patuxet for at least 10,000 years. They lived off the land, fishing, hunting, and raising corns, beans, and squash. They had no chief or leader as such, and their early spiritual life was represented by worshiping nature. As such, indigenous Americans had long celebrated their own feast of Thanksgiving. When the Wampanoag first met the pilgrims, there was an uneasy peace between the two cultures. They eyed each other suspiciously, wondering if their intentions were continuing peaceful. The first winter in America, many of the initial settlers died from various causes, but their interaction with Native Americans introduced European diseases for which the Native Americans had no natural immunities. By 1619, around two-thirds of the Wampanoag of 70,000 people had died by those introduced diseases. This period was known as the great dying by Native Americans. However, in the Puritans' view, they saw the great dying as a providential act of God paving the way for them to inherit the resident natives' land. Squanto had escaped the plague by several years earlier, being lured aboard a British slave ship, along with two, uh, a dozen other indigenous members. They were bound for a slave market in Spain. However, off the coast of England, Squanto escaped the ship with the help of some Catholic priests and was able to make his way to London. There he lived for six years learning English and European customs before boarding a ship headed for Newfoundland, and then by another vessel which transported him back to Patuxet to his tribe. There he found his tribe had been decimated by the terrible scourge of disease which the Puritans introduced. Even so, because he was familiar with English customs and the English language, Squanto acted as an intermediator between his people and the pilgrims. He taught the colonists how to raise corn, beans, and squash using the agri agricultural techniques that his tribe had perfected over the years. According to the History.com website, the pilgrims didn't likely invite the Wapanoag to the first harvest Thanksgiving feast as traditionally celebrated. In fact, the 90 or so Wampanoag who were gathered near the colony were startled by celebratory gunfire from the pilgrims during their Thanksgiving feast. However, when they learned that the, gent that the gunfire was not for hostile purposes, they decided to bring in six deer to share with the feasting pilgrims. In honor of the Thanksgiving holiday, which many of our families are celebrating this week, as well as the upcoming season of Advent, I'm going to pause our Luke study. This week we will consider an Old Testament passage in 1 Chronicles depicting the Ark of the Covenant being brought into the tabernacle in Jerusalem. King David gave instructions to Asaph and his relatives who served as priests for the celebration. The tabernacle was a precursor to the temple itself, which would be built by his son Solomon. Turn to 1 Chronicles 16 and I'll begin reading at verse 7. On that day, David decreed for the first time that thanks be given to the Lord by Asaph and his relatives. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, proclaim his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell about all his wondrous works, boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wondrous works he has done, his wonders and the judgments he has pronounced. You offspring of Israel, his servant, Jacob's descendants, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments govern the whole earth. Remember his covenant forever, the promise he ordained for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, swore to Isaac, and confirmed to Jacob as a decree and to Israel as a permanent covenant. 
I will give the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portion. When they were few in number, very few indeed, and resident aliens in Canaan, wandering from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their behalf. Do not touch my anointed ones or harm my prophets. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord, proclaim, proclaim his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. The world is firmly established, it cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them exult. Then the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And say, save us, God of our salvation. Gather us and rescue us from the nations, so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Let's pray together now. Father, this is a time when we pause for a time of thanksgiving to you. We give you thanks, Lord, for all your wondrous works in our lives, especially in sending your son Jesus to die for us because of our sinful natures. Lord, we are thankful that we have the place where we live, the work that we have to do, our families that are dear to us, and the remembrance of those who may have departed us. Lord, may you bless us today, but may we bless you with our acts of worship and praise to you and help us to live for you day to day. For these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we examine the psalm of thanksgiving, which was dictated to Asaph at the direction of King David, scholars have noted that three psalms from the book of Psalms are included in this compendium of praise. These include Psalm 105, verses 1 through 15, quoted in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 22. Verses 22 to 33 in 1 Chronicles 16 quote sections of Psalm 96, verses 1 through 13. Verses 35 to 37 in 1 Chronicles 16 include separate portions of Psalm 106, verse 1, and verses 47 and 48. Theologians who have studied the, this compilation of psalmic material have noted that 1 Chronicles 16 could be divided into three sections. A remember section, which is verses 15 through 22, a praise section, verses 22, 23 through 33, and a giving thanks section, verses 34 through 36. We will use these as our major means of dissection as well. After King David instructs Asaph and his helpers to utter thanks to the Lord by calling on his name and proclaiming his name among the peoples, he tells them to identify the ones who are responsible for singing these words and telling of his wondrous works. These are the offspring of Israel, Jacob's descendants. They're clearly the people of God who were challenged by Abraham to follow their God without bowing to other idols. Abraham was the one with whom Yahweh mandated a covenant to his people. They were to follow God exclusively. They were not to make any graven images or bow down to man-made images or representatives of a God-like person so as so many people among whom they lived worshiped. This covenant was passed down to Isaac and then Jacob. And you'll recall that Jacob would eventually be named Israel as he and his wives produced the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. The people of the Abrahamic covenant 
had to be reminded of their special relationship with Yahweh, especially when they moved and multiplied in Egypt due to famine in their homeland. Even as Moses was used to help deliver the people of God from their slavery in Egypt, he reminded them of the covenant relationship they had had with God as they eventually made their way back to Canaan. The land referenced in verse 18 where God promises, I will give the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portion. This, promises, this promise and others like it are the basis for the restoration of the present nation of Israel as Jews returned to this promised land in May 1948. We see in verses 19 to 22, the people of God were instructed to remember that even when they were few in number and without a designated homeland, God protected them from annihilation by their enemies until they were restored in Canaan. Beginning in verse 23, not only the people of God, but all people on earth were instructed to sing to the Lord, proclaiming his salvation from day to day. They were to declare his glory among the nations as well as his wondrous works. Then the reasons for that praise are given, beginning in verse 25. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is to be feared above all the gods. Here once again is the admonition that the gods worshipped by other people are inferior to the God of Israel. Other gods had no real power. They were only images made by people who wanted something tangible to place on their god thrones in their homes. Why was God to be praised over all these worthless idols? Because, as stated in verse 26, the Lord made the heavens. The act of creation was the very first thing recorded in God's word in Genesis 1. People were instructed to just look around them. Who do you think made these mountains, forests, and great oceans? When you look at the stars in space, don't you see how many there are in the heavens? Their numbers are uncountable, and the God you worship is the one who made all those stars. Look at the identifiers for God expressed in verses 27 through 30. Your God exhibits splendor and majesty, strength and joy. Even the name of God, the inexpressible name Yahweh, is worthy of glory. All about Yahweh God is the splendor of holiness. The only thing that other people can do as a reaction to such a great God is to tremble in the face of his majesty. The creation which the Lord has brought forth is described in verses 30b through 33 as impossible to shake. God's creation is permanent. It won't blow out about like fallen leaves or melt like new fallen snow. Even the elements of God's creation must worship before him. The seas and all the seas inhabitants, the fields and everything found upon them, even the vast number of trees in the earth's forest must shout for joy before the Lord. At the end of verse 33 is a reminder to all of God's creation that one day Creator God will come forth to judge all the inhabitants of the earth for their actions, whether good or bad. This is a reason for all of God's creation to tremble at the mere mention of God's name. I already pointed out that the directions given to Asaph by David began with expressions of thanks. But the last few verses we are dealing with today continue with that sentiment as well. Asaph and his fellow priests are instructed to lead the worshipers and expressions of thanksgiving to the Lord in verses 34 through 36. Give thanks to the Lord. And they, then they give reasons why believers are to voice thanksgiving to the Lord. Because he is good, his faithful love goes on forever. These expressions of thanks are interrupted by a plea to God to save us from all those who would want to do us harm and disrupt our worship of the one true God. The reason, once again, is so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. This broken record of repeated thanks ends with a blessing to the God of heaven. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. We hear, hear these expressions of blessing like shouted syllables echoing off granite mountain faces on and on into infinity. We must admit that we are not part of the ancient people of Israel except that as followers of Christ, we are inheritors of the same expressions of thanks and praise that were mandated to the people of Israel. As members of Christ's church, 
we are inheritors of these principles of praise and thanksgiving. First, give thanks to the Lord for his greatness and his love for his creation. When families gather for feasts of sumptuous special dishes, they eat themselves sick only to collapse in front of the television to see unrelenting sports fair while others plot their Black Friday shopping strategies. But when do we stop to truly remember the source of this holiday? Some families take time to go around the table to allow family members to tell what they are thankful for. That is a great start. Second, remember the wonderful things that God has done for you, something that only a loving God could do. The fact that God cares about each person and loves us should be cause enough for us to give priority to expressions of thanks for all that God has done for us. Yes, God will judge all people one day, but we remember first that He is a loving God. He loves us so much that He sent His only Son to our earth so Christ could teach us the Father's commandments. But Christ also offered Himself as a sacrifice for our sins so that we could stand before God after confessing our sins, thereby receiving God's cleansing for those sins. Third, don't worry when you see injustice in the world. God will judge the world in the end. We must admit that there is much injustice in today's world. Most people haven't experienced injustice personally, but possibly you have. If so, know that you are not responsible for responding to those instances of injustice. God will right the wrongs that are evident in our world today. Fourth, sing God's praises because he far outweighs the insignificant false idols that people create. We may think of false idols as little green or gold Buddhas that some people have in their homes or businesses. I personally watch people prostrating themselves in front of those golden statues and temples, believing that Buddha will somehow help them pass a test, become pregnant, or get them into a money-making position in their company. Watching someone placing their faith in such an insignificant, false idol is heart-wrenching when we know the God of heaven who can hear us and act on our behalf. Our God is more powerful than all of mankind's self-made idols, and we sing his praises for that reason. What kind of heart do you bring to worship today? Is it a heart filled with thanks for a God who loves you? Or do you have problems warming your heart to that kind of gratitude? Trust God and give thanks to Him with all your being.